Hello, biology students. We are going to skip ahead to do chapter 13 on animal nutrition and digestive system. I'm finding that we just have to prioritize. We lost a couple weeks. Um, CLC is kind of okay with us, sort of, you know, we're going to have to skip some material. So I'm really trying to prioritize on what I think is probably the most beneficial for you and the most important probably. So we are skipping ahead to the nutrition and digestive system. Um, we will have a lab that goes along with this. I'm going to do seriously like quick overview. Um, and, and then I think from here forward, no more large assessments. Um, maybe just a kind of a quick assessment at the end of each week. Uh, I hope to set that up on Google Forms. So a quick assessment at the end of the week just to see, you know, to and make sure that you are reading the material and learning something. Um, please be honest and um, do your own work. Um, what happens, um, you know, obviously this, if we don't take things seriously here, it's going to come back to haunt you when you're in college. So I, I do want to maintain that we are, uh, you know, that you're doing your own work. All right, so animal nutrition and digestive system. We're going to concentrate on on the digestive system. Uh, quick uh, chapter outline. Um, so we'll talk about you know the digestive system, energy going in, energy going out. Just a quick overview, um, the digestive process, and then we'll talk a little bit. If we have time, we'll talk about digestive system regulation. No promises there because, you know, we are crunched for time here. Um, if you remember back in biology when we covered the requirements of living things, we said all living things have to take in energy in some way, right? They have to take in energy or nutrition, or they have to take in um, nutrition in some way um, in order to have energy that powers their bodily processes. So for us, and for those of you who, who had um, college general biology last semester, we talked of, and did some testing of detecting, you know, those uh, proteins, fats, um, simple carbs, and complex carbs. Um, so that's how we get our food, right? We have to take, or how we get our energy. We have to take in food. It has to be broken down in this digestive process um, some of it's going to be stored. Some of it will be used for um, as energy uh, to power processes in our body, like breathing and heart beating and making new cells and all of those things. Main steps of the digestive process, and again, we'll go over these in detail, but ingestion is the taking in of food. That's a really important term. Digestion is the breaking down of that food. Um, and we do say mechanically and chemically. So there's a lot of chemical processes, enzymes, acids in our stomach, um, those kinds of things. But mechanically, you know, chewing, breaking things into smaller pieces, the churning that takes place in our stomach, um, that, that also, um, along with the acid in there, um, breaks down our food. Um, you know, movement food must have to move through that gastrointestinal or GI tract in order to fulfill those functions. Absorption, moving nutrients across that GI tract. So we know that the food most moves through our digestive system and through our small intestines, but how does that absorption happen? How does that get transferred out of our intestines? It's kind of a closed system, but not really. It's again, that selectively permeable kind of stuff. Um, and then elimination, how does it get out of the body? Um, we do, so the pathway that food follows as it moves through our system, obviously it goes in our mouth, and this is where chemical, and, and I think we talk about this in the next slide. Um, so we'll talk about, yeah, some of these separately, but from the mouth, um, pharynx is like right, the throat right at the back of the mouth, and then esophagus is the tube that it moves down into the stomach. Um, the stomach, it passes through a sphincter into the small intestine, um, and then eventually into the large intestine and then into the rectum and then leaves through the anus. 
And again, we also call this the alimentary canal. Um, the, the mouth, we have, so this is where obviously food enters the digestive system. It's really important to understand that the mouth is a place of not just chewing and breaking stuff down into um, smaller pieces, but we also have enzymes in the saliva that begin to digest starches. If you chew on a soda cracker long enough, you, you have to chew on it for, I don't know, five minutes or something like that, which is a pretty long time to chew on one piece of food. But if you do that, you can actually, the starch in soda crackers will start to, you'll start to taste a little bit of sweetness. And that's because those enzymes actually are pretty efficient at, at breaking down. Starches are complex carbs and sugars like glucose especially are, are simple carbs. And it breaks those complex carbs, the starches down into simple carbs. Um, so the tongue is important in sort of moving that around. Um, we call it mastification when we chew our food. We're going to skip this slide. So yes, we have teeth. Um, dental caries or cavities occur when, from bacteria. Um, the worst thing you can do is sip on sugary drinks all day long, like pop and Gatorade, sugary and acidic. Don't do that to your teeth. Um, chemical digestion begins, um, I said, in the mouth. We have salivary glands that in our saliva, there's this amylase enzyme. For those of you who had me in 10th grade biology, remember we had artificial saliva um, in, and we actually mixed it with a starch solution and then tested for the presence of glucose the next day. Um, and almost all of that starch would get, we'd leave it sit in the incubator overnight. I don't know if you remember that one. Wish we could do it now, super cool. Um, but yeah, that we, we see evidence of that amylase in saliva. Um, tonsils are actually part of your lymphatic system. So even though they can be removed, um, they are good for, we, we don't remove them unless we need to. They actually are good for fighting disease. Um, but if they get pitted from infection, they actually can really harbor a lot of bacteria and people get tonsillitis and a lot of bad stuff. So we wanna be careful with that too. Um, the tongue, um, ha the tongue is really um, pretty complex, uh, so it has obviously lots and lots of taste buds. Some people have more taste buds than others. So some people actually are we refer to as super tasters because they have you know they have more taste buds than the average person and an increased um, sense of taste. And just imagine how difficult it would be to move the food around and push it like, you know, to your teeth if you didn't have your tongue to sort of facilitate that. And then once the food is all chewed up into this kind of bolus, um, then your tongue actually helps it move to the back of the throat for swallowing. The swallowing, those um, smooth muscles in the esophagus, so this is the tube that's gonna carry it down to your stomach undergo this series of wave-like movements. This peristalsis is the reason you can, you can um, drink water while standing on your head. Try that, you really can. It's because this wave-like muscular motion, even without gravity, would carry food um, and water down to your stomach. So that's kind of interesting. Um, pharynx um, between, that cavity between the mouth and the esophagus. So right at the back of the throat, we see it right here. Um, so you know, here's our here's our mouth. The esophagus is the long tube that's whoops that's going to carry food down to the stomach. Um, and so we say the pharynx is right at the back of um, of the throat. So food moves through there. We also it's also um, air actually moves through that as well. We have some super cool mechanisms that allow us to sort of choose which is coming in, whether it's food or air, and act accordingly. Um, stomach, I do think it's important. So there's, we say there's gastric juices. This is a obviously a sac-like organ. It can hold a lot of stuff and it can stretch. It has a lot of acid and it has a lot of digestive juices in it. Um, it has enzymes too, even though it's super acidic. 
it's very acidic. Um, but it, it has um, enzymes that can survive in, the, in that acidic environment. Oh, uh, pepsin is one that helps us break down proteins. Um, we have a lot of mucus on our stomach, and that's just our stomach has to be covered with mucus so that our, the acid doesn't actually digest the stomach itself. Like, that would be terrible. Um, so there's three layers of, of, um, three layers of muscle inside the stomach. I don't know that I necessarily care about that. I don't think that's super important. Um, it has, yeah, it, it has a lot of, it's a, it's a complex organ. All right. Um, so... Chyme um, is emptied from the stomach into the small intestines every two to six hours, or after two to six hours. Um, through There's a sphincter at the end of your stomach. Actually, there's a sphincter at the beginning of your, of your stomach, too. A sphincter is any, any um, muscle that is um, circular and can kind of open and close. So you have actually a lot of sphincters in your body. Um, but this is, so there's a, a sphincter that opens and allows this um, chyme to be exported um, and secreted into the, it goes into the small intestine. Um, small intestines, um, this is where the big stuff happens uh, as far as um, nutrient uh, absorption. We do have some um, what we would consider accessory organs to digestion, um, which um, the pancreas would be one of those. Um, there's enzymes secreted by the pancreas that are really important in digestion. Um, the gallbladder and liver are other accessory organs, meaning that they're, the food doesn't move through them, but they're pretty important in that whole digestive process. Um, sometimes you've probably heard of people getting their gallbladder removed. You can live without your gallbladder. It's really important for digesting fatty foods, though. Um, so sometimes after people have their gallbladder removed, they, they really have a problem eating fatty foods. Like, that's one of the side effects. Like, if you don't have enough bile, then you can't break down that fat. Um, but um, the small intestine is the this is where all, almost all of nutrient absorption occurs, okay? Um, so yeah, just re it's all about that nutrient absorption. That's why the small intestine has to be so long, like 18 feet long. And it's also why it has these little, um, we say villi or, and microvilli, these, these little uh, finger-like or hair-like appendages that line the intestines that just really increase the surface area so that it's a lot more efficient at um, absorbing nutrients from the foods that we eat. The large intestine, on the other hand, um, is an organ that's uh, primary function is absorbing water. It's much shorter than, um, much shorter than the small intestine. It's, it's right, so after the small intestine, um, your, your, um, food that that a lot of the nutrients have been absorbed out of then gets um, gets moved into the large intestine and we do um, you, I mean we can separate them into sections right so we the colon rectum anal canal even the cecum is a little like appendage that sort of goes goes off um, the appendix is part of that uh, again, one and you can live without your appendix. Um, it's a it's a projection off of um, the side of your um, large intestine. We think it plays a role in in fighting infections. Um, we think years ago maybe there were some enzymes produced there, um, but we find we can we can live without it. It's not as important as it maybe once was for us. In addition to water absorption, there are some B, some vitamins that are that are absorbed by the large intestine as well. At the end, we have the 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 rectum, and then the opening at the end is the anus, and that is uh, the anal sphincter, another sphincter at the end. Um, and we'll stop there. <laughs>